I would like to start asking how many of you have heard about Alzheimer's disease? Now, how many of you have heard or know why Alzheimer's occurs? I will say that this is a remaining question that the neuroscience community is still looking for an answer. Therefore, there is no cure for this condition. Today, I want you to forget everything you know about Alzheimer's. Forget every previous idea and open your mind to the idea I will present to you today. And to talk about this idea, we should start thinking about memory. We all know that memory is important to set our future actions and also to make connections with others, to make relationships. But how do we remember? How is that process by which our experiences are converted in memories? Think back to a really vivid memory. Close your eyes and think in a memory that you have from a few years ago and you still keep in your mind. Now that you have that in your thoughts, I'm going to tell you about mine. One year ago, coming back from Saskatoon to Regina, I was with all my lab partners and we got the worst experience that we could have in winter. That was my very first winter and we got in a really icy and slippery highway. Suddenly, we lost the control of the car and we flipped. We flipped twice. And let me tell you that that happened one year ago and I still remember everything. I remember my struggle to get out of the car because um, the side door was destroyed. I remember the cold weather when I was walking to reach the ambulance. I remember everything. You also thought in your really vivid memory. Now try to get what you got for lunch three weeks ago. <laughs> memory, maybe you don't remember that. But how's that? How's that that we can remember some things so well and not others? Let me tell you that the answer for that question relies in our mind and how neurons communicate with each other to make some process to start our experiences like memories. So the thing is when we have an experience, just like having a special supper with our family or having a really bad car accident, that memory enters to our brain a sensor information that travels all along a network of neurons making a process that we call synapse. So neurons make synapse to communicate with each other and store our memories in our brain. So we have the sensor information that enters to our brain and it travels all along this network of neurons to a part of the external part of our brain that we call cerebral cortex. Then the information lies there for a few seconds to a couple of minutes. But if that memory is strong enough, we can transfer that memory from the cerebral cortex to a mid part of our brain that we call hippocampus. The hippocampus is a main part that can transfer that memory back to the cerebral cortex to be stored as long term. So this is showing us how important is the hippocampus to store our memories as long term. So it's important for long term consolidation. But we didn't know that until one time in 1952, Dr. Milner and Dr. Scoville took away the hippocampus of a patient that we know HM. It sounds brutal, but they did this because they want to, hit, to help him with some bad epileptic episodes. And they actually helped him because when they took away his hippocampus, that patient didn't suffer from more epileptic episodes. But all surprised that after this, he couldn't remember anymore. He couldn't retain information for more than 20 minutes. He couldn't retrieve information that he had from before. But he was still able to make mechanical skills such as riding a bike. So this is showing us that the hippocampus is really essential to store our memories as long term. But there are still certain regions in our brain that help us to keep some mechanical skills that we need for example, to ride a bike. 
so far our best approach to understand how the hippocampus works and how we store memories as long term is a process that we call long term potentiation or LTP. Long term potentiation is just the process by which two neurons communicate over and over again to store our memories as long term. And that happened to me when I had that car accident and that happened to you with that special moment that you have. And this also explains how we learn by repetition. Every time that we repeat information over and over again, our neurons are communicating over and over again, increasing the efficiency of that communication by repeated stimulation. So this is how we store memories as long term. But what happens when Alzheimer's disease occurs? How does it occur? How can this just rub our memories and erode them like sand? To know that, we should be conscious that Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia, a condition that affects more than 50 million of people suffering from this disease around the world. Although Alzheimer's is related to seniors, this could happen in any population under the 65 years old. This could happen even in younger population before the 40s. And this condition just gets worse when we realize that every 24 hours, 10 people in Saskatchewan are diagnosed with dementia, which in most of the cases, we are talking about Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Alzheimer is called the long goodbye because this gradually decreases the, and produces the declining cognition of patients. And at the, although this declining cognition entirely depends on the patient, we have certain stages that we could consider here. So in the early stages is when the first changes in the brain occurs. So declining thinking, cognition, and also confusion occurs and the person starts asking the same questions over and over. They forget plans, decisions, names, their keys, and they could suffer from insomnia, depression, and their social abilities just get lost. They could also can lose their autonomy. They will need help for basic daily tasks, such as speaking, walking, eating, or dressing up. Later, they cannot control their movements, they cannot smile, they don't have facial expressions, and at the end, they cannot recognize their loved ones. This is a really sad a final stage because their symptoms can let the patient to die. We don't know completely how this happened, but what we know is how a brain with Alzheimer's look in comparison with a brain with, uh, that a normal brain. As you can see here, a brain with Alzheimer's is smaller and it's, it has some toxic components that make the cells die. So because the cells are dying, we are losing a lot of tissue. And as you can see here, we, you, we are comparing a normal brain with a brain with Alzheimer's. And as you can see here, a normal brain has a complete hippocampus while a brain with Alzheimer's doesn't. That means, and this is actually how Alzheimer's starts. This starts in the hippocampus, so neurons die, and we don't have cells that can communicate with each other with a pulse of electrical energy to store our memory, to make long-term potentiation, and then we don't have memories anymore. If we make like a zoom on it, we're gonna see cells that are dying because of a beta. A beta is a protein that in Alzheimer's is caught in pieces that are not useful for cells. So cells cannot take it and it eventually starts to accumulate in the brain. It clumps together forming plaques that kill neurons, make us unable to remember. So it sounds like Alzheimer's. To understand this, this disease, we need to understand a beta. We need to understand the interaction between a beta and neurons. And here you can see the comparison between a healthy neuron with a neuron that is dying because of a beta. 
And the tricky part is that could happen 20 years since a person starts to accumulate a data to the moment when that person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So time is playing a role here. And I would like to think that we could just try to diagnose that person before and do something before we have a damage, like a, lo a massive loss of tissue that is irreversible. I would like to, to change the story. We know that the drugs are still failing in clinical trials. But what about if we could do something in the lab and check how the cells are? with a beta and know what is the interaction, what is the pathway by which cells are dying. And this is what is my research about. And to do that, I isolate neurons from the hippocampus and the roots of the spinal cord of mice. And we can play them with a beta, just to know how the cells are in the presence or absence of a beta. And then we can just try different combinations of a beta we work with two kinds of proteins, a beta 42 and a beta 38, which are just 42 and 38 repeated fragments of a beta. And then we can measure that electrical activity that neurons make to communicate with each other. And I can do that with a system that measures the electrical activity of neurons by touching the cell membrane of an isolated neuron with this system. And what we have here is that every time that neurons are healthy in healthy conditions, they are not exposed to a beta, we provide a stimulation and they give us a response. This response is about 100 units of electrical activity. But when they are exposed to a beta, the response that we have, although we are providing the same stimulation, is almost zero. This is showing us that a beta is decreasing the electrical activity of neurons. And this is bad, because without electrical activity, neurons cannot communicate with each other. They cannot make long-term potentiation, and then we don't have memories. This is the same graph that we had before. Our control group of neurons that doesn't have a beta. And this is how a neuron, a healthy neuron, should respond. But what happens when we have a beta? We have this decrease in the electrical activity. Now, I wanted to know what happens if I remove a beta from my cells. And when I get here, I get a recovery in the electrical activity of neurons. So we have some recovery. The cells get healthier without a beta. And now, after several combinations of a beta 42 and 38, we discover that a beta 38 can recover the electrical activity of neurons just like they were never exposed to a beta 42 before. This is showing us a result that can actually recover the electrical activity of neurons. This could also explain the interaction between a beta and neurons. And maybe after some treatments, we could block what is happening in Alzheimer's to help to help you guys, to help also the people that are suffering from Alzheimer's today. I want you to forget that there is no A cure. I believe that here we have a potential treatment to understand a little bit more of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you.